Good night and welcome to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Arkansas's virtual classroom. My name is Josh Rainey, the director of the Institute, and I'm so honored to have you here this evening with us to learn about not only an important moment in history, but an important moment that is impacting us today as well. You know, when we first planned this program last fall, we were unaware that we would need to offer it online or in a virtual format, so I'm so honored that our instructors and presenters tonight were willing to do that. With that being said, I'm now going to turn it over to Solomon Birchfield, co-chair of the Arkansas Poor People's Campaign. Thank you, Josh, uh, and thank you to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Arkansas for hosting us tonight. Uh, in behalf of uh, my co-chair, uh, Dr. Reverend Anika Whitfield, uh, and myself and the entire Arkansas Coordinating Committee for Arkansas Poor People's Campaign. We want to welcome you. Um, those of you who are joining the class this evening or will watch this video later, it's my pleasure to set things up and just introduce our instructors this evening. And I will ask you um, uh, during the class if you have questions to just jot those down and save them. At the end, we'll have a, a question and response as, as time allows. Uh, by way of introduction, I want to say that societies change when people build movements. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of learning about the 1968 Poor People's Campaign and its modern day relaunch. We'll begin by reviewing the history of moral struggle in America and conclude with a close look at the conditions around the 1968 campaign and the uh, relaunch of the Poor People's Campaign in 2018. We're in a unique position because we're not just learning history for history's sake. Rather, that history is possible in the street at this very moment. So we are grateful for our instructors who uh, and guide us in putting our own moment in this historical con context. Our instructors this evening first uh, is Eric Hughes. Eric is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Arkansas, specializing in US history and the global black experience. Eric founded Very Enterprise, a community organization promoting education and social justice including collaboration with the Poor People's Campaign. When he's concluded, he'll hand it off to our second instructor, Shanika Smith. Shanika is a graduate student in history at Henderson State University. Thesis project, Rediscovering the Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Poor People's Campaign, 1968 and 2018, highlights the ongoing struggle for equality in the United States of America. So with that, I will turn it over to our first instructor, Eric Hughes. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, um, first, I would like to extend some thank yous to uh, Josh Rainey and the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, uh, as well as to Solomon and the Arkansas Poor People's Campaign. Thank you for uh, this opportunity this evening. And I wanna say, uh, in addition to that, thank you for the work that you do. And uh, Shanika, thank you for the outstanding work that you do as well. Um, so tonight, my role is to basically introduce the history of moral struggle in America, as Solomon uh, indicated. But uh, the history of moral struggle in America is uh, as I tell my students, I, I teach history. I, I guess I'll start with a little bit about myself. Um, so I teach history, uh, U.S. history at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, uh, mostly to 18 and 19 year olds. But however, I do get um, students of all ages in my class. And um, in addition to my research, we discuss these various topics, uh, various thematic movements throughout U.S. history, uh, including the uh, the social justice movements that have occurred. And so when I talk to my class, I tell them, um, you know, it's a very, very daunting task to break down, um, you know, a couple hundred years of history at least into um, six months. And so tonight my task is to break that down into 
about 20 minutes. So we're going to take about a 50,000 foot overview of some of the moral struggle that has occurred here in, in America. And I'm going to start by sharing a presentation that uh, should help this discussion move along. So I'm going to share this screen first. Make sure I get that right. Share and start show. So we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to look at the history of uh, moral struggle in America. And I'm going to look at this as um, a class conversation, a class conversation. All right. And class is going to play a significant component in how we look at America's willingness or unwillingness to address poverty and the moral struggle in this country. And I start with a tragedy. I start with uh, a fire that took place uh, in the Gilded Age. We're going to pick up from with our 50,000 foot view in the Gilded Age. And I start with a fire that took place um, slightly after the Gilded Age, but the, the, the fire is what transformed mentalities in America towards poverty and situations uh, surrounding um, poverty and urbanization. And so the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire took place in 1911 in New York City. And the fire itself was, a, was basically the manifestation of Gilded Age economic policies. So when I talk about the Gilded Age, I talk about people that you may have encountered, people like Andrew Carnegie. We'll talk more about him uh, in a minute. But these, um, these robber bands or these individuals and leaders in industry um, basically had free reign um, in relationship with the United States government to establish the, their own rules for how uh, the corporate structure would operate in America. And so these bosses of these uh, corporations and these robber barons were allowed to basically dictate the terms for their labor uh, conditions and the labor that their employee labor conditions that their employees experienced. And so in New York City at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, the founder of the factory uh, had a practice of locking the doors uh, in this factory. And the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was on the, uh, I believe, the, the 10th floor of this building in, in downtown New York City. And the building caught on fire and the women were locked into the, the factory itself. And the logic behind locking these women into the factory was one that reflects the mentality of these robber barons and these leaders of industry. Uh, they locked the doors to prevent theft and to prevent unauthorized breaks that women would take uh, during their work day. And so 146 people, uh, primarily women and children would die. Uh, you would see uh, women jumping out of the building uh, faced with this uh, dire decision uh, and many took their own lives in the, in the open view of the public. So this, this tragedy, much like we see today with the with the murder of George Floyd, uh, galvanized action. It galvanized American attention towards conditions for working class people, especially in urban areas like New York City. And so some of the hardships that these working class individuals who who comprise who were responsible for developing the wealth for uh, these robber barons and these leaders of industry, uh, the majority of labor themselves lived in abject, abject poverty. Uh, some of the hardships that these laborers faced in, in American cities uh, were overcrowding. Um, they, they didn't have any safety regulations at their uh, places of work. Uh, they were forced to work long hours in factory conditions and unsafe and unsanitary factory conditions. And children at this time were exposed to these conditions as well. Um, children uh, were a significant component of the the early 20th century economy. And the Gilded Age itself would uh, give rise to the progressive era, but the Gilded Age set a lot of the mentalities about how the American society viewed poverty and viewed the poor. And so this is just uh, 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 some statistics on the growth of urban populations, as you can see at the turn of the 20th century, uh, year after year, urban populations were growing. Uh, there was an increase in American cities with people of uh, 100, 100 plus thousand. Um, and as I indicated, their child labor was a significant component of the child labor was a significant component. 
Oh, sorry. I think my video froze. There we go. Sorry, guys. Let me get back to my screen. Getting through these technical difficulties. Um, so yes, as I uh, was stating earlier, child labor was a significant component of the early 20th century economy. Uh, you had more than two million women working in uh, industries and factories around city and cities around America, and so the Gilded Age was. Uh, significant, as I stated, because it, it shaped many Americans' minds on how society should view these conditions and the conditions of poverty. Um, so, so when we look at the Gilded Age mentalities, many of them were shaped by people like Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was, of course, a proponent of the origin of the species and natural selection, and his ideas were uh, adapted to society by a man named Herbert Spencer, who transformed uh, Charles Darwin's ideas about uh, nature and evolution into social commentary. And his ideas were coined into social Darwinism. And social Darwinism was essentially the idea that uh, people were fixed into their positions in society. It was the idea that people, um, the millionaires themselves, were supposed to be millionaires due to natural selection. This is a, a, a quote from uh, Yale sociologist William Sumner. and He said, the millionaires are a product of natural selection and acting on the whole of the body of men to pick out those who can meet the requirement of a certain work to be done. So it was a understanding in Gilded Age society that people who are wealthy were wealthy because of natural selection, because of the way that humanity and society was evolving. And it, conversely, those who were poor were poor for those same reasons. Um, and all of this stems around a capitalist ideology. And the, capital, the capitalist ideology of the Gilded Age um, was built on five tenets. And these tenets outlined that a natural aristocracy was the, the, the rightful uh, uh, leaders, were the, was the rightful leader class of the American economy. And that these people at the, tops of, at the top of society will make uh, decisions towards the benefit of everybody else in the rest of society. Uh, they, capitalism at this time also stood on the fact that if the state interfered with the economy, that it would upset this natural selection. And capitalists, uh, people who propose uh, the capitalist theology also believed that slums and poverty were an inevitable part of the competitive struggle in this new economy, in this capitalist economy. And so you saw people like Andrew Carnegie, um, immigrants, other people come to this country and begin to build wealth. Uh, Andrew Carnegie built his wealth through steel and steel production, and he introduced new business concepts like vertical integration to help accumulate um, just astounding numbers of wealth, astounding amounts of wealth. And for example, this is Andrew Carnegie's um, home on Fifth Avenue, as well as his vacation home in Scotland, right? So this is the type of money that these uh, early leaders of industry and early um, capitalist leaders were amassing off of the backs of those individuals who were um, living in those worst conditions. Um, and so at the turn of the century, there was a turn towards a, a more progressive outlook on how to approach these problems. Uh, progressivism itself was just the idea of promoting progress that change uh, can be achieved and that individual rights themselves must be balanced with the public good. So it was no longer just tolerable for uh, people like John Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie to set any uh, working conditions for their laborers uh, and, and, and trust that these individuals were making the decisions at the benefit of society instead of at the benefit of their own pockets, right? So this was a significant shift uh, in ideology away from ideas of social Darwinism and towards more ideas of uh, social justice, right? Uh, one of the actual leaders in this shift in mentality was Andrew Carnegie himself. He proposed the idea of the gospel of wealth. And the gospel of wealth is, is, is uh, essentially the idea that the wealthy had a financial, the financially wealthy and successful had a responsibility to use their wisdom and experience and wealth to help the poor. And so this was the beginning of a shift in mentality uh, towards how to address the situations of poverty, especially in American cities. 
and some of the problems that progressives wanted to fix um, included political corruption, uh, consumer safety, but uh, primarily they were dealing with uh, economic issues and poverty and overcrowding, right? But there was a moral component to uh, the progressive movement as well. And so the progressive movement itself was comprised of a variety of people with a variety of goals and a variety of objectives coming from a variety of backgrounds. And we're just going to take a, a quick view of some of the individuals who established the foundation for people like Martin Luther King Jr. and the movement that took place in the 1960s that they would build upon. So in the, the area of moral struggle, we can definitely look at the church as a leader in this in this um, in this fight against uh, the 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 onset of capitalism and uh, the social issues that followed. So there was a father named John Ryan uh, who wrote A Living Wage in 1906. And he uh, basically espoused in the early times that a decent standard of living, a decent living standard was a natural and absolute right of citizenship. And Father John Ryan was building upon ideas that were proposed by uh, the leader of the Catholic Church, the Pope, Leo XIII. He actually um, wrote a an edict called Rerum Novarum. And in this edict that that uh, Pope Leo wrote, he basically was indicating that the church had a responsibility to endorse social justice over competitive and individualistic competition. So these leaders in, in the church were looking at how capitalism was impacting society, especially with the rise of consumerism. And they were saying that the church had a responsibility to step up and uh, take a role in providing help to those who most need it. Um, another uh, leader of uh, in the church, uh, the leader of the Baptist Church in New York um, in Hell's Kitchen, his name was Walter Rosenbush. Uh, he believed that Christianity was a revolutionary faith. Uh, he wrote Christianity and the Social Crisis, and he talked about how uh, Jesus Christ himself was a radical. He talked about how if you look at the, the teachings of Christ and Christians themselves should follow Christ's example by serving the poor and the powerless, those in the streets. Um, they believed in a social gospel that Christians had a duty and responsibility to advocate for social reform. Um, the purpose itself in there of Christianity in people like Walter Rosenbush's mind was to transform society. Um, and so Rosenbush was a very influential uh, figure. He was a very influential public figure. Uh, he would influence uh, President Theodore Roosevelt and President Woodrow Wilson, but he would also go on to influence uh, Martin Luther King. When Martin Luther King would begin to uh, initiate his movement later in the 20th century. Now, as a historian of race and society, I have to look at um, what black people were doing during these times, because when we're talking about poverty in America, largely we are talking about black people, not solely black people, but largely we are talking about black people. And so black people were responsible in pushing these conversations about uh, the moral struggle forward uh, before the progressive era and during the progressive era. Um, people like Richard Allen, uh, who started the AME church, people like uh, Charles Hamilton Mason, who were uh, influential in uh, churches in the South, like the Church of God of Christ. All of these people were pushing the idea that the church had a responsibility to get involved in the communities that they served. And even individuals that you may not know, like Charles Octavius Booth, uh, who actually pastored Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, where Martin Luther King would uh, become one, would eventually become pastor, were uh, vital to initiating community and social reform through uh, the realm of the church. And at this time, the black renaissance and those black artists and those black intellectuals who were putting out uh, information were also uh, critiquing society and holding the mirror to America and saying, the way that you treat the least of these is the real reflection of American society, right? Um, outside of the church, you had uh, individuals like Ida B. Wells during this time who were uh, again, bringing uh, awareness to the way that individuals were being treated at the lowest rung of societies. Um, in addition to lynchings, uh, she wrote about the, the Elaine massacre that took place here in Arkansas. And if you study on the Elaine massacre, you understand that these people were, uh, were organizing to improve labor conditions in East Arkansas. 
And so there were people like Ida B. Wells and organizations like the NAACP and the UNIA and the National Urban League that were founded during these times to try to address the same issue of poverty and how to um, basically create a better situation for those at the lowest rungs of society. And so with that, I'm going to um, with that, I'm going to leave it uh, to Shanika, but I will say that stop sharing my screen if I can. I will say that I agree 100 percent with the assessment that Solomon gave. OK, can I, yes, I agree 100 percent with the assessment that Solomon gave about us being in a very important time um, with the conditions being the way they are with everybody's awareness heightened towards uh, the conditions that black people and those at the bottom of society uh, are facing, class is an important aspect of this conversation. And no matter which end of the spectrum, of the class spectrum that we may fall, we all are involved in this, uh, in this moment. And whether we're reflecting on history that has been lived or whether we're dreaming and creating the history of the future, we all are facing the same question that people like Martin Luther King were facing in their time when the Poor People's Campaign was initiated is, will this moment be a strike point in time or will this be a, a, a condition changer for society? Will we remember this time for the activities that took place or will this time be transformative because we changed the, the, the systems that created society that we know? So I will leave it there, and I hope I didn't take too much time, but Shanika, I believe it's yours now. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope everyone is safe, and I hope everyone will be able to learn something on tonight. Um, yeah, my research is dealing with the Poor People's Campaign um, the original Poor People's Campaign and why it has uh, resurfaced in the last uh, 50 years. And while I'm pulling up this screen, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and share my screen. But um, I I'll just go ahead and say um, I think it's really important that we take a look at now in retrospect to um, our history and really begin to really ask ourselves why are we still fighting the same fights that we fought 50 years ago, uh, 100 years ago, uh, 150 years ago. Yeah, no, just let me know if you can't. Okay, so um, yeah, so um, my paper analyzes the socioeconomic history surrounding the creation of the Poor People's Campaign in 1968 and why Dr. King, uh, you know, felt led to go ahead and launch such a, a radical, uh, at the time, uh, a radical campaign to really shape the nation and to get systems of control like the government and not only the, the public sector, but also private sector um, to really get them to understand that in order to change this dynamic surrounding uh, persons of color and the poor, you have to change the systems that place people, certain people on top and leave the rest to have to deal with uh, debt and other anchors that pull people constantly in a stuck situation where they can never get themselves and pull themselves uh, out of it. Um, <clears throat> So my research deals with when Dr. King um, did his speech in 1963 and he told us all that he had a dream. Over the next few years, 
Dr. King expressed that he saw his dream turn into a frustrating nightmare. And so we'll see as the, the campaign gets ready to, to be launched in 1968, how um, his, I'm sorry, it says you may want to put your, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Hold on just a second. <laughs> Let's see. Thank you. Let me go back, 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 back. I'm sorry about that, y'all. Okay, so uh, the Poor People's Campaign, unfortunately, was under undermined greatly uh, with uh, the assassination of Dr. King and and never was able to achieve its goal. The goal of the original campaign, however, has revived under the direction of uh, Dr. Dr. Bar Barber, Dr. William J. Barber, and and it it includes Dr. King's dream of the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and it's 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 an expansion of of that. Um, that piece of legislation that they tried to um, get past, but but it, it didn't happen. And so King, he stressed the need for the Poor People's Campaign to morally challenge the nation and its governments to understand the economic challenge challenges that many Americans faced back then as they do today. Um, he also, Dr. Barber also, with the direction of the uh, the new Poor People's Campaign, he stresses the redistribution of wealth for the poor as, you know, everybody, and especially in this crisis, this pandemic, we can certainly see um, the struggle, the financial struggle that many uh, people face. Um, so, um, okay, so now the civil rights era between 1965 to 1968, what we see here is Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference members like Jesse Jackson, they, they are leaving the South. The, um, the, the, the Civil Rights Bill has been uh, passed in 1964. The Voting Rights Act has been passed in 1965. And so... We're seeing the civil rights um, movement transform itself as Dr. King and 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 his people go to Chicago in the north. And Dr. King says, if we can uh, tackle the issues of systemic racism and poverty in the north in Chicago which is really the test case, then we can stomp it out uh, everywhere in the United States. And so uh, between, okay, so 1965, those bills are passed. 1966, they transition on into uh, Chicago and uh, they're faced with a whole lot of um, backlash on both sides, actually, um, from the, uh, you know, black members that, that lived in Chicago that worked for Richard May Mayor Daly, uh, the Daly Machine. It was really, really hard to penetrate that um, system of control there in Chicago because you had um those who were not of color not wanting to intermix and intermingle chicago i believe still is today one of the most segregated cities in the united states and so dr king and his team um when they tried to uh tackle housing they tried to tackle you know the job market they they dealt with both public and the private sector. They were dealing with real estate agencies 
there who, you know, if you're a black person, you walk in and you ask, you know, if, if there are possibly rental properties or properties up for sale. No, we don't have anything. But then a white person walks in and they can get a whole list of things. These are the types of things that they were dealing with in Chicago. And what was even more frustrating is you had so many people, both black and white, who were fighting Dr. King to try to uh, get some of these things changed. And um, so really that was the precursor for um, the Poor People's Campaign that launched in, in 1968. Um, so in, in October of 1966, uh, about 500 uh, poor people made up of mostly single mothers staged the first Poor People's uh, March on Washington. The protest was short lived as there was not enough uh, publicity to gain much national attention. However, it was the precursor to the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. So in 1967, uh, Marion Wright Edelman, um, actually, she, um, she goes to Washington, D.C., and she meets with Congress. And she is discussing poverty in um, Mississippi, and she asked the senators, and Robert Kennedy, Kennedy was there. She said, "Look, if you really want to know what poverty really looks like, come to Mississippi and look at it for yourself." And and Senator Kennedy actually did. He came, <clears throat> he went to uh, to Mississippi, and he saw the the. The, I mean, the horrible conditions that people lived in. Babies with no shoes, no no food, no, I mean, it was third world poverty, you know, to put it mildly. And so um, he lets her know, you know, tell King, I said, to bring the poor to Washington. And that's kind of how it got started. So by December of 1967, you have Dr. King announcing that uh, the Poor People's Campaign will be going to uh, Washington in the spring of uh, 1968. Now, um, Dr. King <clears throat> had wrote about the Economic Bill of Rights in his book, uh, I believe it was 1964 that was published, but his book was called Why We Can't Wait. And in that book, he discusses um, you know, civil rights itself was a great start. It it got policies changed, but in order to really change a system um, that works off of a, a money scale, you know, Dr. King put it like this, in order for America to transition, it's going to cost it something. Because in order to get these systems in place and to keep them running, it costs something. So he created an economic bill of rights uh, for the disadvantaged. And so in retrospect to the South versus the North, what we see here is de jure um, segregation happening in the South where policies are put in place such as Jim Crow that really don't allow people to you know be free and those are changed uh, within in, in within that time frame but then when you get to the north you have a so-called de facto style of, of um, segregation meaning by preference or by choice but that's not actually the case when you are forced into it. Say, if you're a black person, you're forced to live in, you know, one section of of the city. You're not allowed to buy property in another section of the city because the real estate agents won't assist you, and you can get an FHA loan because you know you don't quote unquote qualify. So these are the type of things that you saw the difference in the South versus 
the north and uh, let's go to the next slide um resurrection city was when like i said dr king planned on going to uh, back to washington in um april of 1968 and resurrection city was created it was a little shanty town you know that uh thousands of people of, around the country got together and they went to washington now mind you dr king was assassinated on april 4th of uh, 1968 about three weeks before uh this you know campaign launch and they created it and the plan was to stay there to get congress to look at the bill of rights and to go ahead and implement these things like you know a change in in housing and um uh, fair housing you know uh fair wages and things like this that essentially dr king's economic bill of rights was um similar to the economic bill of rights that fdr wanted to implement about 20 years before however that that never happened and so really what we're hearing is a lot of the same today when people are asking for universal health care and um you know fair and living wages and that kind of thing all of those things were the same and you can see those in his books and um of that era unfortunately resurrection city was tore down about six weeks uh into them trying to to get Congress to listen and to change uh, policies. But after about six weeks, they had the uh, officials there in Washington, D.C. go ahead and tear it down. And nothing, nothing was done. And so what we see over the next 50 years is pretty much a stagnation uh, over time that causes a whole lot of um, um, you know, a whole lot of debt to accumulate. I want to go ahead and look at Dr. King's speech, The Three Evils of Society, because it really brings home, um, you know, what he was dealing with in that era and what, what, what we're dealing with now. Um, he said in his speech, Extreme materialism and economic exploitation works like this. Greed and exploitation creates the sector of poverty in the midst of wealth. And so what that really means is if you subsidize a certain section of, 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 of American society, that's good and all, but what do you do with the rest? Because there's a balancing act here that we have to pay attention to. Um, so either you're going to work to uphold society as you know as a nation uh, economically, or you're going to leave a lot of people hanging in, in the balance. And so, in the three evils of society um, speech. He tackles extreme materialism, racism, and militarism, and how much really does uh, you know does war cost us? And Dr. King, towards the end of that speech, he let us know, I intend to keep these issues mixed because because they are. And so um, I just want to read you this uh, because I think it shows the consequences of the racial wealth gap. Although Dr. King, um, you know, he wouldn't be around to see what will happen in the next 50 years. It certainly seems that he had a prophetic eye to be able to know after analyzing uh, so much information uh, from from various um you know, part of history and policy and politics and, 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 and everything. And this is what he said. He said, the dilemma of white America is the source and cause of the dilemma of Negro Americans. 
just as the ambivalent of white Americans grow out of their oppressor status, the predicament of Negro Americans grow out of their oppressed status. It is impossible for white Americans to grasp the depths and dimensions of the Negro's dilemma without understanding what it means to be a Negro in America. Over and over again, it is said in the black ghettos of America that no white person can ever understand what it means to be a Negro. There is good reason for this assumption, for there is little in the life and experience of a white uh, of white America that can compare to the curse this society has put on color. And yet, if the present chasm of hostility, fear, and distrust is to be bridged, the white man must begin to walk in the pathways of his black brothers and feel some of the pain and hurt that throb without let up in their daily lives. And so it was just kind of chilling when I first read that because if we really analyze politically, socially, economically, um, even before this pandemic and the George Floyd um, you know, issue occurred, it certainly seems like this was a foreshadowing over the last 50 years because increasing uh, wealth inequality continued to rise over those next 50 years and the financial anchor of debt that the nation faces is not only um you know is is heavily um on the shoulders of the poor and minorities but now we're beginning to see year by year that more and more white people are poor as well so um okay now I'm sure, you know, we're kind of familiar with the ideas surrounding racism. However, there are two examples I think we need to really look at in terms of racism and how it works in housing and the uh, urban renewal and slum clearance initiative that took place after World War II. <laughs> seem to certainly target um, metropolitan cities that were heavily urbanized and had a lot of African-American um, you know, citizens. And so urban renewal and slum clearance um, really decimated a lot of African-American wealth. Um, and, you know, just one example is Little Rock, Arkansas. But we saw this not only in Little Rock, we saw it in uh, Los Angeles, California. We saw it in Miami, Florida. We saw it in Detroit, Michigan, Cincinnati, Ohio. We saw it all over the United States. And it was by way of the 1949 Housing Act. And so this is also a way that we can see how economic exploitation and racism does certainly intermix and intermingle. So by the time President Harry Truman took office in 1948, the lack of civilian housing was in crisis mode. There was a massive shortage of available housing for servicemen returning from World War II. Therefore, the 1949 Housing Act was passed to calm housing concerns and the urban renewal program was a part of its package to modernize cities across the country. And the term urban renewal was a blanket term given to the quote, redevelopment of land in urban areas. Conservative Republicans wanted to get the bill passed quickly while Southern Democrats, uh, Democrats wanted to keep segregated housing in place. So both sides had to compromise in order to get the piece of legislation uh, passed. Both the House and the Senate passed the bill, yet rejected integration amendments. So therefore, the, it, it, this is what it says. It says, this is what the housing, uh, 1949 Housing Act says. It says, the elimination of substandard and other blighted areas, slum clearance, 
involves the acquisition of blighted and slum areas for the purpose of putting the acquired land to a more satisfactory use. This does not mean that they will be necessarily used for housing purposes. And so what we see, for example, in Little Rock is West 9th Street Little Rock is targeted. People are told to sell their homes, sell their businesses who are persons of color and move to the outskirts of the city. And essentially, monies were funneled in to begin to create suburb, uh, you know, suburbs. And of course, white people were allowed to move into those and African Americans really lost a, a, a lot of wealth um, during this time um, in the nation's history. So we jump ahead a little bit to the 2008 recession. And this again, where you see 53% of African American household wealth disappears and it hasn't returned. Um, in fact, if you if you uh, research this this closely, what you see is the the top one percent really were the only ones who essentially gained anything back from the recession. Um, m most people, however, that that was not the case. And so during the two thousand eight recession, racial housing discrimination didn't end with the 1968 Fair Housing Act that was implemented actually about a week uh, after Dr. King was assassinated. He was assassinated on the 4th of April, uh, I believe April the 11th, the Fair Housing Act, uh, LBJ signed it in, into law. Subprime mortgages during uh, this, uh, the 2000 era, heavily targeted minority communities. As the 2008 Great Recession created an economic downturn for the nation's economy, variable mortgage interest rates increased and caused many under the subprime mortgages to go into default. As a result, lower to middle income families lost their homes to foreclosures and were forced to move into lower income, quote unquote, inner cities. Some prime subprime loans were specifically designed for borrowers with a high risk of default and the higher interest rates were charged on these loans. Federally regulated banks and other lenders designed these loans to make repayment difficult over time. For example, in Chicago, black borrowers were four times more likely to have a subprime mortgage than white borrowers. In 2000, 41% of all borrowers with subprime loans would have qualified for a conventional financing options with lower rates, a figure that increased to 61% in 2006, and African-American mortgage recipients had subprime loans at a three time uh, higher rate than white borrowers. So what we see is with this housing crisis, like I said, 53% of household income in the black community disappears. And many of these people who would have had the opportunity to be in a, a fixed interest rate, get these variable mortgage rates. And when your interest rate goes up, your, your house payment goes up as well. And so during this time, I worked in this sector and I got to uh, speak to a lot of people uh, during that time who were trying to get loan modifications to try to save their homes from going into foreclosure. And ironically, a lot of those people were from Chicago and many of them were uh, people of color. And it was a struggle to <laughs> continue to stay uh, on that job because you're talking to people on a daily basis who could possibly, um, you know, be facing foreclosure or they're trying to get a loan modification and, you know, their income versus expenses might not balance out. And so 
you know, just say if their interest rate goes up and they had a $500 note, well now because their interest rate has ticked up, now they have a $650 or $700 mortgage. That may not seem like a lot of money, but when your raises and bonuses have not went up on your job, then you're trying to figure out where you're going to get an additional $150 to $200 a month. And that's a struggle. That was a struggle for people then. And I'm with this pandemic, it's certainly a struggle um, today. Now, I want to just quickly uh, look at how much does war cost? And let me just find this because I want to, to state this. Let's see. Mm -hmm. So militarism, how much does war really cost us? Now, the estimated cost of Dr. King's Economic Bill of Rights for the disadvantaged at the time would have been $32 billion. So if we look at that in terms of today, that would have been about $242 billion. Um, now, that $32 billion number was the same amount of money it was costing to fight in the Vietnam War. And uh, that's really when uh, Dr. King began to uh, discuss not only the Vietnam War, but how do we transition out of spending so much money for war because the war in itself is taking um, taking the eyes and the focus off of how to deal with the issue of poverty. The U.S. wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Pakistan have cost um, the, uh, America about $6.4 billion since they began in 2001. So if you look at that over time, $6.4 trillion divided by about 19 years, that's about $336 billion in today's terms, um, in today's money. So that, that number is well over the amount to tackle economic inequality. However, we don't really see a whole lot of policies uh, pushing out to really deal with the issue of poverty, but certainly, you know, wars are still, you know, getting their money. So, um, yeah, we discussed the urban renewal and slum clearance and a little bit about um, subprime mortgages. Now, I want to show you this because I think it really uh, kind of just hits home and just tells us, listen, capitalism works best for those who own capital, period, all right? And no capital plus no credit equals no generational wealth. When things come in like, like urban renewal and the housing crisis of 2008, where many people of color and the poor that live in urban and integrated um, cities across the country when they no longer have access to equity in their homes, when they no longer have access to capital, they cannot make ends meet. And they cannot access the credit that they need to be able to rebuild their lives. And so this chart just shows you from about 1965 uh, up to about 2014. And these numbers haven't, have not changed that much. In fact, the median um, household income today is still about $34,000, $35,000 for, um, for um, African-Americans. So um, as we can see, white Americans, uh, th this is before pandemic, you know, so, we can see that they made about sixty thousand dollars a year, in, in you know retrospect to Black Americans who made roughly about thirty-five thousand dollars. And there's so many different examples of how that breaks down in terms of whether people are you know college educated or not college educated. Even still, with college education, African Americans still make significantly less than their white counterparts, who a lot of times 
actually don't have a college education. And home ownership in the United States, it, it's, it's, it's pretty much more of the same. You see that majority black neighborhoods at a glance, 37% of US uh, black population that live in these cities, their houses are devalued. About $48,000 less average loss in home market value which equates to about $156 billion in cumulative losses. That's a lot of money. People don't, don't have the ability to pull that equity and possibly start their new business that they're wanting to start. They don't have the, the option to do that because the capital and the credit, the assets, they're just not there. And so when we're talking about ecological devastation, we're talking about the moral narrative in terms of Christianity. America really has a choice to make here. This is not this is not a time of wanting to talk about these things and do something about it. This is a time of needing to do something about it. Like we don't have a choice in the matter. We have to do something. There's a difference between a want and a need. And right now, we need to do something. You know, people in Flint, Michigan, I've heard Dr. Barber say this so many times, you know, they can't even get unleaded water, but they can gas up their, their vehicles, you know, with you know, unleaded gas, like it makes no sense. The We have about, I believe, about 10 years to deal with this global climate change issue. Now, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of world are we leaving our children and our children's children? Will we even be able to leave them a world that they can sustain themselves and live in? You know, these these are these are things that we need to not only discuss, <laughs> but we got to do something about it because this is not the time to reflect back on history and say, oh well, that was then. No, it's now. We're still fighting the same fights that we were fighting 50 years ago. Civil rights era. The the a hundred years before that, there was a civil war. We have to begin to look at the patterns of history and see what they're telling us. America at this time is at the same economic quality level that it was before the stock market crash of 1929. That's a statistical fact. So are we going to continue to allow the greedy to continue to be greedy and and hurt us all? There are, and, and there's a, such of a thing as the greedy can't be too greedy. <laughs> so we just got to know this. And I think the problem lies in us not wanting to treat others like we want to be treated. You know, that's what Jesus taught us. That's what he said. He said, I'm paraphrasing, but basically, if you don't remember anything I told you, remember this. To treat your neighbor like you want to be treated. So America as a society, as, as individuals, as a collective, we have to be honest enough to recognize situation, circumstances, and current events that are going on. What does history tell us about these things? And what can we do to fix these problems? Not because we want to, but because we need to. Like, there's a need here. And so in order to be able to do that, you have to give yourself the opportunity to be honest about your reality. And be courageous enough to change it. Now, if you um, if you like, uh, you can jot these down. These are just some current 
uh, stats that, you know, I, I'm just kind of curious about that kind of stuff. During the pandemic, and just to, you know, give you a quick little insight, consumers spent a ton of money on groceries naturally because their kids are home, they're not going to school, uh, they're at home, either they've been they've been furloughed on their jobs and stuff like that. And so, I was watching when people first began to get their um their um stimulus checks. People were buying a lot of groceries you know it, it it certainly seemed like where i live people were focused on that and also um it, it's another statistic that says 60 to 70 percent of people report that they're making more money on unemployment than they were actually making on their jobs so we have a federal um a minimum wage that is about seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. If we had a kept up with um, the way things are supposed to be in terms of economics, minimum wage would be at about twenty dollars an hour, but it began to stagnate during the 1970s. That's terrible. These are real issues that we have to face, and America as a nation as individuals and as a collective has to choose which path it's going to take because history certainly has shown us already time and time again what happens when we don't tackle these issues we will have to revisit them later on down the road but unfortunately we are in a time crunch at this point because if we don't make decisions quickly we may not have uh, the opportunity to just revisit these things again. All right, Solomon, I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> Thank you, Shanika <clears throat> and Eric. Uh, I saw on the final slide there, America, which path will you choose? Um, and we have a saying in the new Poor People's Campaign that is, everybody has a right to live. And hearing Eric and Shanika share about the history of our country, we know that has never been true. Everybody has a right to live. And if we love, to love America is to love what we can become, what we can create together. Uh, I know you have some questions and want to interact with Eric and Shanika this evening. Um, first, I want to offer an update on what has been happening with the Poor People's Campaign here in Arkansas uh, and let you know about a major Poor People's Campaign event that is happening on June the 20th. And when I conclude with that, uh, we're going to have a little time for discussion and questions and response. So the new Poor People's Campaign was launched uh, in 2018, 50 years after the original uh, launch of the, of the Poor People's Campaign, the year that Dr. King was assassinated. In Arkansas, we participated with more than 30 other states um, organizing weekly events in our state capital. We brought folks from around the state together each Monday uh, to highlight one of the issues of systemic poverty, systemic racism, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false, the distorted religious narrative of white Christian nationalism. And we engaged in nonviolent civil disobedience each Monday at the state capitol at the same time as 30 other states in, uh, to help launch the new people's campaign. Our team uh, uh, activists and moral uh, interfaith leaders have organized multiple other events, things like a hearing where we invited elected officials and candidates for office to hear directly from people impacted by racism, poverty, um, ecological devastation, war, and distorted moral narratives. 
we have hosted poverty tours. Uh, we go and sit in, in somebody's living room and hear how a single mom budgets for her family working a job with poverty wages. Um, we have done uh, voter registration drives and we have tried to build a movement that votes. We know the movement is bigger than just voting, but it includes voting. In a short time, in the last two years throughout Arkansas, we have seen a budding coalition, what we call moral fusion organism forming. Uh, organizations that focus on poverty, racism, or militarism, and the war economy, or ecological issues are coming together in ways that we've never seen in Arkansas. People around the state are connecting. Folks in Little Rock and Fayetteville and Fort Smith and Jonesboro and El Dorado and uh, Derma and, and Crossit and uh, Mountain Home, people all over the state are connecting. Moral leaders from every faith tradition have been part of these uh, poor people campaign gatherings. So we believe there is a movement growing in our state, uh, native to our state, connecting people, gathering people, building power in a movement that votes together with a national campaign. Uh, coming up a week from this Saturday on June the 20th, there will be all 50 states in America participating in the uh, Poor People's Mass Assembly and Moral March. It is a uh, online digital gathering. We intended to be in Washington, D.C. as a national movement uh, to put pressure on the agenda that this national election um, is highlighting in choosing what America we become. Uh, but the pandemic obviously has, um, has uh, co constrained us. So this will be an online digital action, including people from all 50 states. So I'd like to show you a one minute video uh, that introduces you to what's happening a week from this Saturday. And then we will be moving into the time for discussion. Sorry, I'm figuring out my own tech as well. I'm gonna go lo-fi with you here. Um, the video I show you, I'm just gonna be holding up to my screen, <laughs> using this screen. Times like these, that people from all walks of life must build a broad and deep a powerful new movement is rising across America, from the Mississippi Delta to the Apache stronghold, from the homeless encampments of Washington to the coal fields of West Virginia. We are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, and we are building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 20th, between the primaries and the general election, we will rise together for the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, a digital justice gathering. Our nation is at a historic crossroads. There are those who say big change isn't necessary or possible, that we are powerless to make our lives better. But history teaches us that it is exactly in times like these that people from all walks of life must build a broad and deep movement from the bottom up. On June 20th, we will come together to lift the voices and faces of poverty in the midst of pandemic for a massive historic online gathering that will embolden us, strengthen us, and prepare us to fight for the kind of society we know we so badly need and deserve. Rise with us. Visit June2020.org. Okay, I hope you can see that. All right, uh, I am going to put that up on the screen as well. Uh, in order to participate in the June 20th event, it's very easy. Uh, you can go to June 
www.ghostbusters.org. Uh, there will be a live stream hosted there on the website. You can go there right now and you'll see a, a digital organizing kit and an overview of what will be happening um, on June the 20th. We will be hosting the largest digital and social media gathering of poor and low wealth people, moral and religious leaders, advocates and people of conscience in this nation's history. A global pandemic is exposing even more the pre-existing crises of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy and militarism, and the distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. So please put down June 20th on your calendar. It will be a two hour program starting at 10 o'clock Eastern time then again at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So that's 9 o'clock and 5 o'clock here in Arkansas. And then there will be another event on June uh, 21st on Sunday uh, as well in the evening. So I invite you to um, take the history lesson that we have all participated in this evening and not let it stay in your head. I encourage you uh, to become a builder of the Poor People's Campaign. We are not about starting book clubs and just learning for the sake of learning. We, we believe this is our moment. This is our time to shape what, uh, to reconstruct what America is uh, into a society where every person truly does have the right to live and to thrive. So with that, I would like to invite our instructors to come back on with me. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. With your video and audio, if you can. And I know that as you all were listening this evening, you probably had um, thoughts, uh, you probably had questions. And so this is an opportunity for you to bring those up and and just talk with Shanika and Eric about some of that. Uh, I've not used this platform before, so I'm not, I, I believe that each of you who is in the session this evening, at the bottom of your screen, there's a microphone and you're able to uh, take yourself off of mute. So if you have a question, go ahead and take, uh, take yourself off mute and we will give you the floor. Everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, this is Anika. Um, what a wonderful class. I'm so glad I was able to participate. Wanted to ask the three of you, um, what brought you um, to this movement? And um, why do you personally feel like this is something that other people should consider being a part of? Um, I can start. Uh, so, hi, Anika. Uh, thanks for being here with us tonight, and thanks for everything that you do uh, in this movement as well. Um, I was intrigued to learn about the revival of the Poor People's Campaign, being uh, a student of history and uh, just an admirer of the work that uh, people like Martin Luther King and many others did uh, during that time to create better conditions for the world that we have now. And like Solomon was saying, you know, learning for the sake of learning is is only productive from a selfish standpoint. And so uh, I wanted to find ways to share the information that I was learning and grow the talents that I had and, and, and invest them into the work of our time. And so when I was approached with uh, the, 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 the new wave of the Poor People's Campaign, I thought it was something that... Uh, I wanted to commit uh, myself and my work towards. Yeah, um, I mean, really what, what got the ball rolling for me, uh, specifically with the, the Poor People's Campaign is at the time I was still 
uh, working on my thesis and it was the summer of 2018 and I was at home. Actually, I was uh, recovering from a surgery and I was just I was just like thumbing through channels and I saw um, Dr. Barber, he came on to do a talk and he was talking about the poor people's campaign and he was uh, this, he mentioned the three evils of society speech and he mentioned the other America um, a speech that Dr. King did in the 60s and I had never heard of the poor people's campaign and so I had to know what it was all about so I went to my computer and I started looking for these speeches and the first one I looked at was the other America and it was about I was about 22 minutes in and it, it was about a 45 minute speech and I just had to stop and just kind of get myself together because it was like that the king was approaching the issues of his day they sound so similar to the issues of today and for me I, I was seeing him speak from really a political science standpoint more so than a religious standpoint and I, I I just I knew at that point I had found my primer in order to be able to pull all of the things that I had been researching for two years at that point how do I bring all of these pieces together because truly for my research if you track the money you track the motive and so I think looking at the you know economics along with policy along with you know social uh, injustices and unrest and then uh, dealing with the housing crisis it certainly seems like all of these sections were intersecting at this point of truth and that point of truth was dishonesty and you know manipulation and 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 you know and so I, I was I was just I, I was just intrigued from there. And so for me, you know, growing up as a kid, we was taught to always root for the underdog because let's just keep it 100. Being a black in America, you always the underdog. And so, you know, I understand, you know, that, that, uh, that feeling like you always have to work twice as hard to, to even be considered equal. And so that that's just kind of how it was for me. And so, you know, I'm just kind of with you, Eric. When I get information, I want to share it, you know, to whomever it will help because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to always learn and glean what we can from each other, and that's how we become better. Thank you. If you don't, if you don't mind, Shanika, I'm going to quote you on Facebook with that one. If yes, ma'am. You track the motive. It's, it's, it's on. Yes, ma'am. That's awesome. <laughs> and thank you, Anika. Anika, um, for those others who are on and don't know, Anika really is the vision and the passion. She does. She's not good at taking compliments, but she is the vision and the passion and the love at the center of building this movement in Arkansas. So I love you, sister. Love her too. Love you all. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anika. Cry to the people. <laughs> <laughs> Power of the people won't stop. That's right. <laughs> Who else uh, would like to ask a question and kind of prompt? I don't. I don't have a question, but I have a. Piggyback on 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 the moral narrative and the moral uh, when it comes to uh, black community and has always been one sided from the emancipation to Jim Crow to segregation as well as the civil rights movement. Um, I wanna I wanna thank you guys for allowing me to to be. Um, a part of this forum. You guys are so eloquent and you guys touch all bases. And I, I too would like to share this with, um, with everyone that I know. 
I think it needs to be heard. And, you know, the system has been broken for quite some time. I'm 50, 55 years old, and the system has been broken all of my life, um, you know, and it's unfortunate. But like God said, all things must change. So with that said, I want to thank you guys for allowing me to uh, be a part of this forum. And thank you, Shamika, for, for, for doing your due diligence. And like you said, with your, with your other moderator here, all power to the people. That comes from, you know, who that comes from. Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. So in those days, it was, it was, it was about unity. And I think that unity has taken a, 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 a separate step right now. And it's not just about African Americans. It's about all people believing in the just cause. I want to thank you and I'm out. Thank you. Thank you as well. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, that's, and I think that's what we're seeing. I think what this pandemic has really given us the opportunity to do is slow down enough to really see what is really happening and how we going to do something about it. You know what I'm saying? And and I can't help but think about George Orwell's 1984 book. It's one of my favorite books in the whole wide world. And he has a quote in there. He says, if there's any hope, it lies in the prose. And the prose were the bottom base people who really, in his book, it's a novel, but he, it really, they were the ones who were considered the freest in society but they had the least. And he said, if there's any hope, it lies in the pros because it's more of us than it is of them. And when we think about it truly, how these systems, these systems of control have duped us all, they really have. And so it takes all of us, black, white and everything in between being able to see the duping and know that we all been had good way bamboos led astray we all have been okay so now what are we gonna do about it so yeah I, i'm so grateful to be living and in, in this time because it's truly a a shift a moment in in reality in this time that we can never be the same whether we like it or not we have to change this is not a want it's a need to change you know and so that's amazing mm -hmm. well, um, in the interest of time we are approaching that 8 30 mark where we promise to to let people go so I want to tell you, you can continue this conversation. Um, send a, a Facebook message to Arkansas Poor People's Campaign. Um, make sure that you sign up at June2020.org because we need everybody to know that there is a, a campaign building that is uniting the poor, that is uniting people across race, across the country, across all the, the injustices that impact people, uh, that we are coming together. And we won't be silent anymore. So uh, please join, not as a student, but as a movement builder. Um, and join me in saying an enormous thank you to Shanika Smith, to Eric Hughes, um, for sharing your expertise and, and uh, educating us today to go do the work. Thank you all. Thank you. With that, we will let you join. Have a great evening, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Shanika. Thank you, Solomon. Thank y'all so much for allowing me to.
talk tonight and stuff. It was great. Yeah, thank you all. Thank again. you all. Enjoy. Mm-hmm. Forward together. Thank you. thank you all too. We enjoyed it. Step back. Good night, everyone.